Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that you're teaching us how to be led by the Spirit and uh, walk in the light of your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last week we began on part three, talking about the ways to be led by the Spirit of God. And the number one way was through the inward witness. Number two with the inward voice, which is the conscience. Number three, the voice of the Spirit. And we kind of covered that. And then we were, going to, we were going to get to and we didn't get to. So I'm not sure how long this will take us. It might take us the whole service. It may take us less. But you know what? That's okay. Other ways, of, other than the primary three ways of the inward witness, the inward voice, which is the conscience, or the, or the voice of the Spirit, that He leads us. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter 27, verses 9 and 10. Acts 27, 9 and 10. Paul speaking here says, Now when much time was spent and when suddenly was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Now, um, the word here, if you, sometimes perceive can be used almost be in line with the inward witness. You know, you had a, you had a knowing, whatever. But this particular Greek word, uh, comes from uh, Theora, T H E O R something. Oh, again, I think. But it comes from a classical Greek word meaning to look into, to see. Uh, it's migration through Septuagint usage and then into uh, classical New Testament Greek usage. It came to mean to, to see um, in a figurative sense. And so what Paul was saying here is, uh, I see, and this is hard to explain, but you know, it's almost like when you, in certain things in the spirit, you, you can see it, not a vision, not, not, you know, God up and had a vision, maybe something the kind of dad used to call like a mini vision. He used to call it, that's what I call a mini vision, M-I-N-I, -N -I. that's what he always said, mini vision. <clears throat> but Paul perceived or it's like he saw everything that was going to happen without having a vision. And so that, that was his, he perceived, that's what this Greek word kind of means to see figuratively. And so uh, they were on this trip, and he saw the outcome of what was headed their way in, in, a, in a perception. And said, so God can lead us that way. You could see things. You could see outcomes. You see the things ahead. Again, not necessarily in vision form, but in perception, you had the picture painted. And uh, here's one of those cases where Paul had that happen. And, um, and, and, and in the end, it happened pretty much except that all their lives were saved. Okay, remember the angel Lord stood by him that night and said, I'll, I'll give you all those, you know, the losership, but all those with you will live. Um, so it was a warning. They didn't listen. You know, uh, you need to listen to God. Uh, or when people are walking in the Spirit, you need to listen to them. If they're really walking in the Spirit. I'm not talking about fruit, fruitcase stuff. You've got you to have um, some spiritual journey under your belt. Um, You've got to have some spiritual credentials before you start going around telling everybody what they're supposed to do and not to do. And even this guy didn't tell him not to do it. He just said, I, he said, I just perceive this is what's going to happen. And um, in that particular case. So per perception, this perceiving here, then we only had this happen one time that we, that we actually have a record of in the, in, the, in the book of Acts, New Testament. Let's move into some of the spectacular guidances. Now Paul, when he was before King Agrippa, said in Acts 26, 19, I, uh, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. And we have that vision recounted, uh, recorded in Acts 9, uh, 10, 9 through 11 and 19 through 20. So let's read that. On the morrow, as they went on their way, journey, on, on their journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up the, uh, upon the housetop. Um, did I say Paul meant Peter? Um, Peter said before King Agrippa, upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten while they were ready, but he fell into a trance. And he said, and, and he saw heaven open, and a certain, just forget what I said about who, who, who told Agrippa. We'll, we'll figure that out here. Okay. Uh, on the morrow as they went to their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour and being very hungry. He would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him, and it had been a great sheet knit at four corners and let down to the earth. While Peter thought on, these, on the vision, 
The Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Rise, therefore, go down, and, and um, go down, get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And um, so we have him going down, and we know what happens at that point. He goes to, uh, he goes back to Cornelius' house. They get saved, baptized the Holy Ghost. But what did this was a vision. Peter says, as he thought on the vision, the Holy Ghost said. And it was a symbolic vision. It was an allegorical vision. It wasn't a, you know, you shall eat pork and so forth, which, you know, we know from this we can, thank God, barbecue. Anyway, but it was an allegory of, because uh, remember, it actually goes on in these verses we didn't read, uh, not so, he said, rise, kill, Peter, eat. And he said, not so, Lord, nothing unclean has ever crossed my lips. And he said, what the Lord has cleansed, thou shalt not call it unclean, etc. And then, and then it becomes apparent that he's, he's sent these men, that vision was given as a allegory to them that the Gentiles are now acceptable before God. Okay? All right? And so um, I'm, I was um, trying to get back to... Acts 26, 19. I, I completely left this out of my um, notes where uh, Paul had the heavenly vision and, uh, and then he went out and started preaching to me and then he testified, I was not a disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Okay? I got to get completely left out of my notes. Somehow I'm going to have to go back and put them back in there because uh, that's, that's, that needs to be in there. Okay? Um, but Paul goes before, he has a vision. Okay? And the Lord, the Lord told him and said, I'll show him great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Amen? And he sent him to the Gentiles and sent Peter to the Jews. And then he told him, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And so this is, this is spectacular guidance. Um, another area of vision we had leading was, was, in, the, was, was in, the, in the Gospels where um, uh, Joseph, Mary's husband, on several occasions had an angel appear to him and give him direction. Mary had an angel appear to her and tell her about Jesus. Joseph had, had dreams and had visions within the dreams of what God wanted him to do. Leave Egypt, you know, go to Egypt, leave Egypt, go here, go do, I mean, all, you know, until Jesus was safe and, and ready to grow up and become who he was, Joseph had been led by visions. So we, we refer to these as spectacular guidance. These are not everyday occurrences. You're not going to have your angel showing up every other day giving you, you know, what time you're supposed to be where. He's not your daytimer. All right? Just not. Angels are not there to show up every other day or every three days to give you what you're supposed to do and all that kind of stuff. We have recorded in the Bible when visions take place and manifestations take place along these lines. It is considered spectacular because it doesn't happen that often that we have recorded. Okay? Jesus had the angel, angels uh, come and minister to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and so there, there are times of a great importance and import. And notice that these visions... And things took place in order to carry out the will of God. Not so you could be cool and go around telling them, I had a vision, you know? Amen? Remember that if there is something along this lines, it's, it, it will be of great import and great importance and of great necessity for God to do these things in order to bring to pass something of, uh, that's important to him for um, reasons we may not necessarily be aware of or why it had to take place that way. But just know that they're, they're not, you don't seek after visions. I remember Brother Copeland said a number of years ago, he read Brother Hagin's book, I Believe in Visions. And he got to seeking the Lord. Lord, I want to have a vision. And then he started using the word, trying to manipulate the Lord. Lord, your word says you're not a respecter of persons. I'm, and so if you gave Brother Hagin visions, you can give me visions. And your word says you're not a respecter. So the Lord said, okay, I'll appear to you. He said, but it'll set your ministry back five years. You might, and, and actually, you might not ever recover. See? Why? Because he would begin to depend on the visions instead of being led by the Spirit. We have, we're led by the Spirit. Thank God if God uses certain, you know, uh, a vision or uses a spectacular mean of guidance, but we cannot consistently depend upon that or demand that. Okay? Uh, God, God has reasons for doing those things, and um, usually they have, uh, because there's greater things involved 
and a larger scope of things involved than just us and us getting it something, you know, buying the right car. He's not going to give you a vision for the car. He can't, he didn't say he can't, but let's face it, folks. I mean, come on. He really doesn't care unless it's a bad car. He wants you to know it's a bad car. If you want to drive one that's a matchbox size and you enjoy that, fine. If you want to drive them stupid little cubes around, of all the man, I, mean, I got about six manufacturers making this little square cubey thing. Go ahead. Now, just don't buy me one. If you do, give me the title because I'm going to trade it in next week. Just saying. All right. The, another another way of spectacular guidance is through prophecy. Um, Charisma Online had an interesting thing of that. They had a they had an article on how to judge personal prophecy, and you know and it was pretty accurate. You know, one of the things was. Um, does it line up with the word? Two, does it, is it, does it um, glorify the Lord? Uh, one, th one of the other things was, um, um, is it beneficial with biblical principles? And you got, you got, that's not going to give you a word just so you can run around talking about how, big, how wonderful you are as a Christian. Ah, oh, you're the greatest Christian that's ever walked the face of the earth. Oh, you ain't going to get nothing like that. Okay? But, but there are prophecies. That God does use the, the prophetical utterance. Um, but again, we've talked about this earlier, how that it, it has to be judgeable by those in higher authority and those who know the voice of God. And um, it has to be in line with the written word. Um, <clears throat> it should not elevate the individual to a place of that's beyond what he sh he is or her she is. You know, you got people prophesying that you know they're sending out all these prophets all over the world. We're, you know, we're sending out th a thousand prophets. You know, they're kind of trying to follow the old school of the prophets thing. Well, I got news for you: we're, the school of the prophets ain't here anymore. Well, we're, we got you know that that passed away with the Old Testament. That because that was the ministry gift under the Old Covenant was prophets. All right, but let's look, look at prophecy for a second here. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but, gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. 1 Corinthians 12, 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all miracle, workers of miracles? And, and the answer to that question, all those questions were no. Um, now, here we can read into this 14, 1, that prophecy could be inspired under, and it is. And, and so listen, uh, person, what we would refer to is sometimes we call people as personal prophecy, it's typically going to be, typically would be um, the gift of prophecy, which is inspired utterance, in connection with the word of wisdom, which is a divine facts in, about the future in the mind of God that he's revealing to you, for a purpose. There's always a purpose. Amen? And it is to set in motion his will and his purpose, not to lift you up and to build up your ego. Okay? Um, and so let's look at here an example of a prophecy. And now, behold, I go, and I, Paul's talking here. I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing these things that shall befall me. They are saved, that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Now, here he has a word from the Lord everywhere he goes. Now, this is kind of interesting. Nowhere does it say don't go. The word he said was that afflictions and bonds abide me, uh, uh, await for me there. Okay? And then Acts 21, 4, and finding certain disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. And that seems to be a contradiction to what I just said, right? Except the Greek structure for this particular phrase, through the Spirit, is just awkwardly translated. And so its true meaning in studying that out is this. And finding certain disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul because of what the Spirit said that he should not go to Jerusalem. And they didn't want him to go because they knew what was going to happen. Now that makes that's a whole different take. Because of what the Spirit said, versus who said through the Spirit he should not go. If he said through the Spirit he should not go, then he disobeyed God. But yet, the Lord told Paul in the beginning what things he must suffer for his name's sake. Okay? So the Greek here, um, you know, sometimes the way words translate and, and, and the way the translators do it can bring confusion in a different era, um, 
kind of example, the word charity is a Greek word, agape. Uh, at the time they translate in the King James translation, it was the highest form of love you could to give to somebody who didn't have in, in the English mindset for the, uh, the ruling class, the, the, the great uh, leaders of the country to be charitable to the peons. That was a great form of love. Now it means get to the United Way and help Planned Parenthood kill babies. So, so it doesn't mean what it meant back then. Okay? And so here, even in this particular word, this, this structure of through the Spirit really comes out better when, when it's when, in translating it because of what the Spirit said. So let's read it this way. He, he says in, in the previous passage, Acts 20, 22 and 23, I, be, I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city that saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And then Acts 21 he says, he found certain disciples, we tarried seven days, who said to Paul, because of what the Spirit had said, that he should not go to Jerusalem. And can you imagine? Um, oh, let's say Dad Hagen came through here. And everywhere he went, the Holy Ghost said, you know, that when you get to Tulsa, you're going to die. Now, what would we tell him? Please don't go to Tulsa. Why? Because of what the Spirit had been saying. If that's what the Holy Ghost has been saying, everywhere you got, when you get to Tulsa, we the end of your journey, you're going to die. We'd beg him not to go because we want him to stay. Amen? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be it? And some people may get, get real spiritual and say, well, we want the will of the Lord. But most people, because of their love for people, would not want them to say, well, can't you just delay it? Can't you walk, you know, to New England first, cut across the upper Midwest, go out to California, go down to the California border, cut back across to Florida, swing back by here and then go? We'd figure out, you know, but because of what the Spirit had said, they said, don't go to Jerusalem. The, the, not, not that they, they were speaking by the Holy Ghost telling him not to go to Jerusalem. All righty. Okay. And uh, Acts 21, and the next day we went, we were of Paul's company, departed, and came to Caesarea, where we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was of one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Hallelujah. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And he, when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him to the hand of the Gentiles. But notice what he didn't say. What didn't he say? He didn't say, Don't go. He just told him what was coming. Remember, the Lord said, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Remember when, he's talking, when he was talking to, um, no, uh, there was a certain man, Ananias. There was a certain you know, man who, who, uh, who he offered, he was offered sacrifice to God. God told him, you know, about Paul and, and uh, said, he said, go send for me. And he said, well, I've heard great things about this guy, I mean, things about this guy. He said, well, look. Don't worry about it. He's a chosen vessel. Man. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He was already prepared in the spirit, and then the Holy Ghost confirmed it. Now, isn't this lovely? Because, so, you know, in, in modern day charismatic world, had this happened, we, and Paul got in prison, we'd say he missed God. How did he miss God? If he'd been listening to the Holy Ghost, he'd have never in there. No, he, he heard from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost told him what was going to happen. And he made that choice. I will tell him much, well, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul could have just said no. And gone to hell. Anyway, <laughs> right then. Jesus showed up with Mr. T anointing. Fool, get saved and you're going to hell now. All right. Yeah, anyway. And when they heard these things, both we and that, of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what mean you to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, and we said this, the will of the Lord be done. Nowhere was it prophesied except that one that was awkwardly translated. And really, if you get that correct, correctly, did anyone tell him, even though they told him what was going to happen, not to go? Paul was, was, had to bear the name of Jesus before kings, before, before great men throughout Jerusalem. And Judea and the uttermost parts, of, he carried that, that name all over the place. Hallelujah. All right. And so, and then Acts 23, 11, And the night following the Lord stood by him, and the, the night following the Lord stood by him, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, 
For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so much thou must bear witness also at Rome. Notice Paul, Jesus did not reprove Paul for missing it. And Jesus could have said, now Paul, the only reason you're in this mess is I, I sent 14 prophets by and told you not to go. But the Lord didn't tell him that, did he? As a matter of fact, the Lord said, be of good cheer, just as you testified to me here, you're going to do it in Rome. You know? And remember in one case there, when, when, all, this, when all this stuff was going on with Paul, um, they were getting to question whatever, and he said, I, I appealed to Caesar. Now he could have, now actually they come in and said, we would have let him go, except he appealed to Caesar. He was just told what was going to happen, accepted it, knew it was what he was going to have to do for the Lord, and accepted that course of his life. Amen. Dan Hagen used to say about his life, he said, I would never recommend anybody to do what I did. But the Lord told him he, he needed him to do that. And it was a great price to pay. His family uh, lost years of actual time with him while he was traveling. Sometimes he'd drive all night long just to get to sleep in the same bed with, with, with his wife and get up next morning and see the kids and be back on the road again for two and three months and not see them. He says, I, I don't recommend anybody do that. But, but there was a price to pay to do what the Lord had called him to do. And there was an important price. And, um, you know, it, it was a difficult thing. It was difficult for the kids. It was difficult for the grandkids. But he had to obey God. But he, he would say, he said, I, I just don't recommend anybody do this. If you don't have to do this, don't do this. And if the Lord tells you you've got to do something, you've got to do it. Amen. But I know people who leave their, leave their unsaved loved ones and all this kind of behind all the time to go out and win the world. Um, I don't believe God calls us to win the world and lose our children. Amen. Now, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. Mr. Pat's in the ministry, has been for decades. Pastor's in the ministry. Kids are serving God. Grandkids are serving God. You know? They didn't, lose, they didn't lose their family to the world to obey God. Hallelujah. Amen. So Paul, Paul obeyed. Paul obeyed the, the, the call of God, even though he didn't have to. Amen. Now, let's, let's look in the visions. We're just kind of, kind of hodgepodge, you know, kind of hitting these real light. So prophecy can be given. No, I, I like the fact here. See, Paul already knew it had to be. We just had prophecy that confirmed what he was already going to do. I already knew he had to do. How do you know? Because the Lord said, I'll show him. These prophecies were confirmational to what was coming. He knew it was coming. Amen. So let's look at Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Karen, there you go. Hallelujah, you're Cornelius' group. A devout man, one that feared, feared anybody else Italian in here? All right. I just want you to know, actually, I can trace my heritage back to a family out of Italy. So, yes. And they, they, were, they were musicians and musical instrument makers. The wife married a Frenchman. They moved to France, and then they ended up in England and ended up making... Instruments and playing in King James's court. Hallelujah. So we, have, we, we do have a musical heritage. <clears throat> and uh, if you're wondering, Jamie and I have a family stick. Our, our family line goes like this, and all of a sudden it, it, it comes together. <laughs> 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 We's inbred. All right, anyway. My grandfather and her grandmother were cousins. We didn't know it until about 10 years after we got married. First cousin. <laughs> that, puts, that puts us like fifth or sixth, so it's okay. You got, you got to go home and take all this out now. Don't you just happy? Hallelujah. No, it's, if it's, it's just leave it in there. All right, Acts 10, 1 through 3. There was a certain man in the Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian man, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, gave much alms to his people and prayed to God all the way. Saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And, uh, you know, we can go on and put that. I don't have all that in here. Go ahead and take the next verse up there. 
And we looked, he saw, he was afraid, and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, there, thy prayers and alms will come up before a memorial before God. Next. And now send a job and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Next. He lodges one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seashore. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now, we know the rest of the story. He, Peter came and preached the gospel. Notice angels don't preach. Amen. Even in visions, they don't preach the gospel. It's left up to man to preach the gospel. Amen. God, God demanded that. And so we had that vision called Peter. Peter came. They got saved because he, he obeyed the vision. Praise the Lord. And Hebrews 13, 2. Uh, I love this one. Be not, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And that's a vision. <laughs> and they, they're probably doing something, to, talking to you, guiding you, with someone. I get amazed at some people who see angels all the time to no end. And then we don't ever think about the fact that the Bible says that you might be entertaining them and just don't even know it. Hello. Now, I had a roommate. Hallelujah. <laughs> roommate story. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There was a time there when we were, when we were out in, in, in Oklahoma at, at the Bible school that about every other day he saw his angel, sometimes three times a day. Oh, there's my angel. He's leaned up against the bus. There's my angel. I'm like, where, where? You know, I'm like, Looking for his angel. And I never did figure out why his angel was hanging around so much. And what he was telling him. Now he's just standing there. Anyway. You know. I don't know. I do know that God don't have just do things just so you can tell everybody you saw something. Amen. He's not running around telling you, oh, there's you, 55 times in a week. I saw my angel. My angel's doing this. He's over there doing that. He's standing there just smiling at me. Well, he's supposed to be out doing stuff for you. They're ministering spirits sent for the, to, 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 as servants of the, of the righteous. Amen? All right. So, but really, the Bible tells us that, you know, just be careful how you treat people because you might be entertaining an angel and just don't even know it. Come down and say, how are you going to act? God's going to see if you're going to be ugly or not. And God don't like ugly. Isn't that right? Uh, so, uh, real quickly, spiritual visions, trances, open visions. I know I told you, we were finishing this up. This is the last part of this. Um, Acts 9, 8, and Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. They led him by the hand and brought him into, the, into Damascus. And uh, so what happened? Remember Paul was on his way breathing out threatenings? And uh, had letters to bring all those that found in that way and bring them bound to Jerusalem. And uh, on that Damascus road, and it's about the noonday, he saw a light brighter than the noonday sun. And said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? Now, later on, some of the, the Bible talks about the fact that some heard thunder and some heard a voice. Amen. Now, Paul saw Jesus. The light shone around about them, and it's brighter than the noonday sun. So they all saw something. It blinded him. Not to, so he had an open vision. Okay, he he just actually saw into the spirit. Realm. Saw actually in his his his, his uh, natural faculties still intact. Saw into the spirit realm. That's an open vision. Okay, Acts 10, 9, 10, 9. On the morrow, as they went their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up on the house top to pray. We've already read this. We'll read it again. About the sixth hour. And was very hungry. When he went eating, he, but, uh, when he was ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel. Now, what happened to him? His his spirit, his physical uh, things were suspended. He really uh, what we refer to as a closed vision. Nobody else will see it. He just was in a trance and saw this and, and saw into the spirit world. And um, amen. And then we just we just read it earlier about uh, about Ananias and uh, he said the Lord said to him in a vision. Okay, so we have. Spiritual visions, we have trances, which you can have a vision in that trance, and then just flat out open visions. And, I, and I'm guessing that, um, that Ananias is more of a, of a spiritual vision. He saw into the spirit realm. Paul, Paul was open. It, I mean, people, there's, there was so much going on, people around him was, was getting in on some of that. It was wide open. All right? 
Uh, Peter's was a trance, and in that trance he had a vision. So all these are, are ways that God, and it's kind of funny, among the charismatic word of faith people, we always want to run down to these as how we're being led. Everybody wants to talk about their visions, their trances, their open visions. You know, they saw Jesus, they saw an angel. And the fact of the matter is, the number one way you're going to be led, as we go back and just recap here, is by the inward witness. The number two way you're going to be led is by the inward voice, your conscience. And the number three way is by the voice of the Spirit of God. These other ways do happen. They are functioning in the church and the earth today. God does do these things, but they are not the primary or normal way of being led. When I say normal, I'm not saying that others aren't spiritual, supernatural. I'm saying that God has basically dedicated the primary way for you to be led by the inward voice or the inward witness, then the inward voice, then the voice of the Spirit, and then these other things come as he determines the necessity of it to take place. Now, here's the thing. You can always count on the inward witness to take place. God's always, amen, the inward witness is always available. So the three, other three, you, you can look to those in that order, inward witness, inward voice, voice of the Spirit. The others are simply as God determines. They are, they're just, they're as he, as he wills, as he determines they manifest, as he determines they take place. You do not need to seek for a vision. You don't need to seek for a word. Quite frankly, seeking for words is nothing more than fleecing God. If you speak and say, yea, thou art, the, thou art my son and I am your God and you're supposed to do this and, and I'll obey, that's a fleece. And we talk about being fleeced. Amen. You seek after a word, somebody will give you one. I said, I guarantee, doggone to it. Double doggone. That if you go seeking after words, somebody will show up and give it to you. And it won't be the Holy Ghost. The devil will accommodate you and give you what you want to hear. If you reject sound counsel, if you reject what God's already shown you, and go seeking after something else, the devil will find somebody to bring it to you. That's just guaranteed. And then people, people and then you run off and say, oh, the Lord showed me. The Lord told me. I, I, because so-and-so said, the Lord said to tell you. Yeah, and after 25 times of overriding the inward witness, the inward voice, and the voice of the Spirit, you finally settle down on, you know, uh, Joe Schmo prophet, Prophets Ministries coming through and giving you the word of what you wanted to hear. I'm sure Paul didn't want to hear. So shall the man who owns this girdle be bound and carried to Jerusalem. I'm sure he didn't want to hear that bonds awaited him there and it was witness in every city he went into. Wow, the Holy Ghost was saying it. And I'm going to be honest with you, I think that was as much for the church as it was or more so than for him. Because you know what they would have been doing? The devil would have come in and said to all those churches, Paul missed it. He claimed that he walked with God and heard from God and communed with God and if he was hearing from God, he would have never gotten into Jerusalem and got bound and put in prison. But the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city. Sometimes things are for the people as much as anything else. I've seen prophecies given over people that I know was more for the congregation or the people in that uh, audience than it was for the person. The person already knew it, but God was confirming that to the people. Y'all hear you going home. So don't go seeking what you want to hear. A rejection of the guidance of the Holy Ghost through your primary source of the inward witness, the inward voice and the voice of the Spirit, to reject those consistently and seek after something else is usually a sign that you don't want to do or don't want to act on or don't want to walk in what you were told. I see it happen all the time. Now, I talked to someone one time. They told me, they said they got married, married somebody, and, and, and a spiritual leader in their life told them three times that they weren't supposed to marry. And actually, they said, got pretty stern with them. They weren't supposed to marry them. And they knew it. They got mad and just blew it off and went and did it anyway. 
And then the wife told him later, said, well, after they got divorced later, the wife said, I never did love you. Hello? Well, that's just lovely. Now you, now you, now you disobey and you got all this, this baggage. Now listen, God can restore and God can do all kinds of things, and I'm glad he does. And in their case, he, 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 he is doing that in their life. But, you know, it been a whole lot better not to just, you know. Now let me say this. I believe when that person was telling them that, they already knew in the heart they weren't supposed to. They just overrode that for whatever fleshly reason. Men, let me just tell you flat out. The fact that she's pretty ain't a good enough reason. Oh, my God. Women, just because he's a hunk and makes you sweat. I remember a few years ago, I, I had, we were with one of our relatives, and, and they were talking about some guy, and they were going, oh, I'm like, give me a stinking break. Because I saw him. And they won't know about it. And it wasn't just because I was banned. I asked my wife. She had the same reaction. But even if he is, let me tell you something. You know what happens to your face and to your body when you get older? Don't want to talk about it. There's not good reasons to marry somebody. Now it's all right. I mean, I, look, it's good to have. I mean, I like, I like, you know, having having good looks or whatever is okay. But it can't be your number one reason. You can't override your spirit because they got the right look. Heard somebody told one time not too long ago that some girl said, well, I, "I like your body, but I don't care for your face." <laughs> hey, you're a good-looking kid. Guys, a guys, a good-looking kid. You're thinking. But, but you, so you go marry Mr. Face and Body, and he gets, you know, he might turn gray at, at 30, might be bald at 35, and got Dunlap's disease at 40. Then what you going to do? Well, anyway, I scout off all that because of this. Because when they were being told by a spiritual over, overseer in their life, spiritual authority in their life, this is the wrong thing to do, I know they knew it in their spirit. They overrode it and did it anyway and paid the consequences. Amen. Let me say this. I, I, I've heard of a couple that's supposed to get married sometime soon. That somebody's prophesied and they're supposed to get married. And they don't even like each other. They don't get along. Now they get along as long as they're not in a dating mode. But once they get into a dating mode or whatever, they don't get along. But they're going to get married because somebody prophesied. And number one. You better back off and make sure that you can get along before you get married. And I don't care who prophesied over you. Quote prophesied. Amen. See, notice, as we, let me go back to this, this personal prophecy thing. How Paul, the Lord said he was showing how great things he must suffer. And then when, at this point in time, every city he went in, the same thing was being witnessed. He was going to he was gonna be bound. He's going to be bound. He's going to be bound. He's going to be bound. He even got really strong. That, that um, when Agabus came down, took the girl and bound it and said, this is how the man is going to go to Jerusalem. But never did he tell him not to go. Why? He already knew what he was going to have to, he was going to, have to do. He already knew what he was going to have to do. And it was a it bore witness. Boy, I tell you what, if somebody prophesies something and it just don't bear witness with you, don't do it. Now, I will say, it could be that they're right. And shouldn't have said anything. While we're over here, let's just hang over here for a little while. Y'all mind? Sometimes God will show you stuff that you're supposed to keep your mouth shut about. Oh, yeah, but see, a lot of us, a lot, a lot of preachers and a lot of ministers all want to run out and show how spiritual they are and start sharing everything. Oh, the Lord shows me. That you're going to do this and you're going to do that and you're supposed to do this. Listen, I've had people come up and, and, and share stuff with me and, and want me to pray with them and I pray with them. And all the while I know what the outcome is going to be. But I didn't have a release to share it. Why? Why wouldn't God tell them? Because they wouldn't listen. And he knew they wouldn't listen. 
And so I just knew in advance what was going to take place, but I didn't share it. We have to learn to discern the, 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 the things of God and walk in the realm of the Spirit in a way that we follow God and not our own flesh and our own whims and desires. Now I'm going to tell you something. You start blabbing your mouth and not doing what God tells you to do with stuff, He'll stop telling you stuff. He'll just stop talking to you about things. Because you can't trust you to keep your big blab mouth shut. Hello? I said hello? Oh my. We're all concerned about how much sin we can get away with and still get to heaven. And God wants to walk into a vein and a place where we, we walk in the spirit. We walk in the supernatural. We won't write books about how it doesn't matter what you do, you still get to go to heaven. God's wanting us to get into the book and get into the spirit to a place where we, 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 we become effectual in ministry in the earth. How he longs for the church to rise up. But we're going to have to learn to be led by, how to be led by the spirit of God. Be sensitive to the voice of the spirit. Sensitive to the Holy Ghost if we're going to walk in that place. I read a post by my uh, good friend Guy Dunnick the other day, and he said, people say if you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're not a good leader. But what are the true qualities of leadership? It's not how big your following is. He said, do you have, do you have strong biblical principles? Do you live and walk in those principles? and endeavor to get other people to, to see those same principles and walk in them also. Not how big your following is. Because you can get people to follow you with gimmicks. It don't make you a leader. It makes you a shyster. You know, Jim Jones got them all drink the Kool-Aid and kill themselves. They, because they, they, he wasn't a leader. He wasn't a leader. That wasn't leadership. There wasn't leadership all over him. There was manipulation and control all over him. Amen. We want, we want to take the truth to the world. Amen. We're going to have to be led by the Spirit and walk in the Spirit to do that. There's, there's, there's a great, great, the world's in the people right now. How many, have anybody been looking at the news lately? North Korea's army is saying they just got the go ahead to, to uh, use nukes against the United States. Now, we, they, nobody thinks they really have intercontinental missile capability at this point. I don't want to find out. Hello? And we, we let them keep building and developing their program. We keep letting Iran keep building and developing their program. The world's in a mess right now. And we better know the voice of God so that we can win the loss and get our job done. Amen. What's the number one way he leads, number one way he leads us? And we witness. That's a knowing in our spirit. Second, the way he leads us, in our voice, which is our, the what? Conscience. And is the conscience good for an unbeliever? How about for the believer, the born-again believer? Conscience can be a good guy. What's the third way that God leads us primarily? The, voice, the third way is the voice of the spirit. It's more authoritative, Okay. Amen? So the inward witness, the inward voice, and the voice of the Spirit. Those are the three primary ways. Didn't say they're the only ways. They're the primary ways. And that's what we should be looking to in our life. And if God chooses to give us a word, if God chooses to give us a vision, if God chooses to bring us into a trance, then so be it. Don't you be seeking after that stuff. Uh, I know a group of people, a number of years ago, they, they, they would come down in, to our area, the, the state, and they always have meetings, and they would, at the end of the service, they would prophesy over everybody in the building, every service. If you wanted a word, you lined up. That makes people feel good. Because I don't, I never heard one like, so shall this person be. They'll go bound. 
Hello? Never heard one of those. I never heard one of those. Are you here? You gone home? See, um, oh my. We think prophecy is always going to be hunk of dory and lovely. Sitting in, um, oh, I guess my uh, back in the day, we used to have our alumni. We used to have our alumni week at Rama separate from anything else. Back back in my day, we had prayer seminar, Holy Spirit seminar, alumni week, camp meeting. Those were our four big meetings in Tulsa. Now they've changed a lot over the years. Now we've got camp meeting, you got Winter Bible Seminar, Men's Conference, Women's Conference. Winter Bible is prayer and Holy Spirit Seminar put together, and the Winter Bible Seminar, because both of those are Bible subjects, so they call it Winter Bible. It could be on the Holy Ghost, it could be on prayer, you know. But back, and then now we run, we run Alumni Week concurrent with Winter Bible. But back you know, when I graduated, 1982, the year after I graduated, 1982, um, we had our alumni week, and Janie and I drove out to Tulsa. And then on the last night of the week, on the last night of the, of the, um, the week, we would have a, a, a banquet downtown the Assembly Center. And so, you know, we went, you know, we go to the, the banquet at the Assembly Center, and, you know, we'd all eat and talk and carry on, and then Brother Hagen would get up and start to talk and share. And, and, he, and that, that, that 1982, he got out when I, uh, uh, he went, air, air, another year shall come and go. And there'll be those that are among us tonight that will not be with us. Not that they won't be here, but they'll be absent from the earth. And then he went on. Two of them were in adultery, and one was in something else. He said, now, it doesn't have to be that way. If you'll come and you'll repent, he said, but he said, I know two won't. Next year we got there, he got began to talk about that. He said, two of them died. He said, the third did come and repent. Got straight with God. And by the time he finished, he went, air, another year shall come and go. And it was almost the same prophecy. You think, after the first round, you think you would have got it straight. Hello? And the same thing happened. See, all prophecy is not going to be how great thou art. Hello? How you ever said the awesome preacher, church worker, better than the pastors, you, you should be preaching. Word from God. Are you here? Actually, in the year before I got there, Brother Hagin had, was in class in the, what, what is now Rooker Memorial, but back then it was Rainbow Bible Church Auditorium. And um, he lived up in class and said, I see the cloud of death hanging over you. Falling to the Spirit. There was a man back on the, and Ron, it's not Ron, but there was a guy at the back, kind of like Ron sitting. He said, I see a cloud of death hanging over you. He said, now, if you'll come see me and tell me how many times you had to come see him and talk to me, you can avert death. Now, you come see me. That's what he told him. He left it in his hands. The class, the, the guy died and came and told him, said, look, we, we went to him and said, you going to go see him? He said, no, I'm not going to. He said, I'm not going to go see him. So you're not going to, he said, I'm not going to do a thing about it. It cost him his life. Now, dodo brain, the prophet stands up and says, I see a cloud of death hanging over you and tells you exactly what to do to avert death, and I ain't going to do a thing about it. See, all prophecy is not going to be hunk of dory. My ordination service. Y'all enjoy this kind of stuff? Okay. My ordination service, Jamie, um, for Rama, you know, with, you know I, I've been ordained and, and then ordained with our FC, and then and then got ordained by FCF later, and then the, the 1990 was our ordination service. I'd already been had papers with Rama for a couple of years. It's the first time we had made it back to Tulsa for service, and it was apparent for a lot of people because we had a, a bunch of people getting hands laid on them that night, kind of like the night last year, last winter Bible when Janie had had hands laid on her, that we went out to Tulsa. You know, she had had papers for a couple of years, but she hadn't been there at, for a service to get that done. And so then dad gets there and he, 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 he talks about ordination. He talks about the, you know, the quality and the call. I mean, the, 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 the uh, call and, and then he gets ready to start, and, you know, and he walks up to the first person and says, I'll lay hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ separate you to the ministry God's called you to. Hey, you've been hard headed. You haven't listened to your wife. You've been stubborn. Wow. About the next five or six people he went down the line and did the same thing too. 
Apparently, a bunch of guys won't listen to their wives. And then naturally, and I got to a certain point in the line, and 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 I'm because you know when he started out, you know, you know, going down the line with that. Oh, praise God! I might get a word from the from the prophet tonight. By the time he by the time he started that, I'm thinking I don't want a word tonight. <laughs> it's amazing how you want a word when it's going to be good, and when it starts out like that, you don't want one. <laughs> Hallelujah! And so. He got, about, he got a certain place down the line, I mean, 15, 20 couples down the line. He, and he got over the tongues, as he often did when he got into a ministry line or some type, and just started, I lay hand in, in, in speaking tongues and going down the line. So that's what, got, that's what we got. And I was just like, oh, praise God. It's going to be recorded. It's on television. I mean, it's going to be on the tape. Everybody that was here tonight is going to buy that tape, and everybody's going to see who got spoken to about not listening to their wife. It's just kind of interesting how oftentimes we think everything is one way and then the actual practice from the Bible and so forth, it's not always the way we see it. Not every prophecy is going to be, hunk a door, how wonderful you are, and you're the greatest preacher since, you know, since the Lord Jesus Christ himself and all that kind of stuff. It's bigger offerings. You start people telling people they're going to die and they die. Hello? At least in this era, back in the Bible days, when they came in and died, the church grew. Yeah. Amen. Not now. They, oh, what's wrong with that church? People dying over at Faith and Victory Church, the dead church, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, that's it. Y'all get anything? Yeah.